Hello and welcome to tonight's edition of Tisky Sour. Apologies, we've gone we've we've gone live ever so slightly late. That's because I mean we were all well. I was pleasantly surprised um, to find out that in fact Brits aren't too shy to clap for the NHS. So I live in a, a block of flats in Hackney. It was incredibly loud. Everyone on their balconies. Well, not everyone, but it, it it was actually very loud. Lots of people showing their appreciation for the NHS uh, this evening at eight pm. I wonder if that will become a regular thing. Um, I'm joined by Aaron Bastani. Aaron, could you hear the the clap for the NHS where you were? I could, yeah. My whole my whole road was clapping. It's nice, right? I mean, my partner was doing it. I didn't realize it was a, 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 a I know it was a thing, but I didn't realize it was like a thing thing. And then I heard the clapping on my headphones, the clapping outdoors. I was like, what the hell's going on? Really impressive. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's super nice. I, I was really, you know, like when we saw all of those videos of, I still haven't seen people singing, I suppose. That was the big one from from Italy where, you know, you had people singing from their balconies and everyone joining in. We've talked before, we, we don't know what the what the song would be uh, when it comes to the British context. Um, tonight, our main theme, though, is not going to be you know, clapping and communal expressions of gratitude, but uh, I suppose communal expressions of authoritarianism, potentially, um, and whether or not we risk turning into a nation of curtain twitches. Um, that's partly uh, because of or inspired by footage um, from Derbyshire police, which showed people walking their dogs in the Peak District, sort of shaming them for 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 going out when we're in lockdown. But also, you know, something I've I've noticed in in general, people on social media sort of complaining when people are out in 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 parks and things like that. Um, and we are also going to talk about that same issue. Um, from Rome. David Adler is going to join us later in the show. David wrote a brilliant article for the New Statesman published today on how COVID-19 has shifted Italians' attitude towards the state from one of dismissive cynicism to trusted devotion. More on that later. Uh, first, so the big announcement from the British government today was on support for the self-employed. A great deal of pressure had been applied on the government to come up with a deal for the self-employed, many of whom will have lost their entire income due to self-isolation. And Sunak today announced a scheme which could replace up to 80% of their income, equal to, to the support that was announced last week for company employees. This is how Rishi Sunak explained the scheme. So to support those who work for themselves, today I'm announcing a new self-employed income support scheme. The government will pay self-employed people who have been adversely affected by the coronavirus a taxable grant worth 80% of their average monthly profits over the last three years, up to £2,500 a month. Dishy Sunak giving the goods there. Uh, let's get up some of the details of the scheme before I come to your opinion, Aaron. Uh, so what he's announced, what Rishi Sunak has announced, that self-employed people will be able to apply for a taxable grant to cover 80% of average monthly profits over the last three years. Support will be capped at £2,500 per month, available to those with a trading profit of less than £50,000 last year. More than half of a claimant's income needs to come from self-employment and they must have a tax return for last year. The scheme will initially cover three months dated to March and be paid as a lump sum in June. Um, Aaron, uh, the Tories have touted this as you know a policy which shows that they are leaving no one behind. We're mm -hmm. all in this together. What mm -hmm. do you make of this announcement today? Hmm. I mean, it's obviously welcome. And I think like so many of these interventions, it's positive. I think the the, the general response in terms of fiscal policy, in terms of um, looking after workers has been better than, and businesses too, has been better than the, the public health strategy so far, the communication strategy so far. But there were quite a few holes there. Like for instance, if you don't have a tax return last year for being self-employed, you basically can't get anything. Now, that was expressed in the questions and answers during the press conference. And he said, fundamentally, there's just not much we can do about that. You have to stop fraud, etc." And I just think you look at the way this is being administered. I, I do wonder if a UBI just for the entire working age population would make more sense. Less administration. Uh, and of course, the argument is, well, that means wealthy people get it too. Yeah, there's a thing called redistributive tax, progressive rates of taxation. So I do wonder if a UBI would have been more effective, but it's welcome. Yeah, I mean, it's. I suppose one thing that's striking from 
you know, the Tory economic response to this crisis is how much it seems to be inspired by the Nordic countries. Mm. So we were talk we were talking, you know, last week or the, or the week before about how the government at that point in time had only offered loans for business. That's what we're talking to Steve Turner about um, last week, the Assistant General Secretary of mm. of Unite. Um, but that the Nordic countries had done things like, you know. I, ensure or guarantee 80% of people's wages and 80% of people's average income if they were self-employed. And, you know, a week later, the Conservatives have, have come up with all of it. As you say, the bit that's missing um, is people who, well, either are self-employed but haven't been self-employed for a long time, who will fall between the cracks because they don't have a long enough period of, of um, you know, demonstrating their income and paying tax on it. They'll have to go to universal credit. Mm. Um, which, as we know, since its development a few years ago by Ian Duncan Smith, has been racked with, well, bureaucratic problems, but also issues such as the five-week wait until you start getting paid, um, and various means-tested elements of it means that it can be, you know, pretty, pretty miserly in terms of what it can offer people. And I do think that the Tories do still seem to be resistant to the idea of having a properly generous safety net. So what the Conservatives are doing at this point in, in time, and they, to be fair to them, seem to be doing it reasonably well, is to ensure that people's incomes are replaced or that the majority of the working population, their incomes are replaced um, in terms of, you know, the, the, the damage that has been done by coronavirus. But that does leave a lot of people um, without particularly adequate support, as you say, a UBI would sort that out. Why do you think it is they're so resistant to something along the lines of a universal basic income? That's a good question. I mean, the, the point is we're looking at a multi-billion pound intervention. Uh, we could be running a deficit this year of minus 9%, a deficit of you know 9% of GDP. Why would it be so high? Well, because we're going to see potentially a recession of 5%. Um, you add in this huge government intervention responding to that socialising wages, etc., offering lines of credit to business, well, that's more of a monetary intervention than a fiscal one. And you're looking at a 9% deficit. You're basically looking at the deficit the Tories inherited from Labour after the global financial crisis. So they're obviously willing and able to spend significant sums of money. By the way, this is going to mean that Britain's debt-to-GDP ratio probably hits 100% uh, sooner rather than later, something which apparently George Osborne and David Cameron told us in 2010 that uh, if Labour were allowed to do that, it would mean that Britain would be downgraded to a second-rate economy. Well, it's about to happen on the Tories' watch. G guess what? The media aren't going to say anything about that. Uh, and it is interesting, given they're willing to spend that level of uh, money, they're willing to go to you know 9% deficit, uh, that they're not willing to trial something a bit more innovative like a UBI. I can only presume it's uh, it just wouldn't go down well with their uh, voter base. I guess they're worried about it not working. I guess there's also just an ideological, you know, the ideological architecture of a lot of these people, civil servants, policymakers, politicians, is means testing. Just is, uh, even if it's even if it's less efficient. Uh, and so I guess that's probably it. And, you know, look, a UBI, if it was seen to work in any sense, that would be very hard to get rid of. Whereas this, it's a bit more, you know, this is a continuation of business as usual in difficult times and we could go back to normal once this is over. Yeah, I mean, I think that's it. Because it's so clearly all income replacement, then it, you know, it follows that after the crisis, these things will fall away because people who've been getting 80% of their income um, topped up by the government, presumably when they're, well, obviously when they go back to those jobs, that will stop. Whereas a, mm. a universal basic income, the argument that it should stay once it's been introduced would be much stronger. And I imagine that's why the Conservatives are so resistant to introducing it. It's also worth mentioning there is a big problem uh, with the the announcement for the self-employed today, which is that the payment will come in a lump sum in June, um, which is potentially fine for comfortable self-employed people. So people who have a decent amount of savings and, and money in the bank. And um, that's going to be a big problem um, for poorer people who are self-employed, who don't necessarily have enough money to tide them over for those two months, um, which also, I suppose, raises, as, as well as being a public health problem, because that means that there are many people who, you know, to, to feed themselves and to live a comfortable life over the next two months will have to go to work when actually what we want is for everyone to not have to go to work, everyone to stay at home, mm. as the hashtag keeps, you know, keeps telling us to do, as Boris Johnson keeps telling us to do. But also you could see a sort of political explanation there, which is that the, the Conservative Party really don't want to piss off wealthy self-employed people. 
And no, I don't. I don't mean super rich self-employed. I just mean comfortable mm. self-employed mm. people because they are actually quite a a Tory voting base. It's their base. And, I mean, that's sort of when, the, yeah. So they've got to look after them, right? And mm. it, it looks to me like the people who will fall through the cracks with this policy, either people who haven't been self-employed for very long, or people who aren't self-employed but on zero-hours contracts or something mm. along those lines, mm. um, or are self-employed but have very low savings. They are the people who are going to fall through the track cracks with these policies and they're the people who are let's face it much less likely to vote for the conservatives so you know as you say i think we're both surprised by the kind of ambition of the the policies that the conservative party have put forward over the last week but there are huge holes and the holes are you know i suppose predictably um applying specifically to marginalized vulnerable people young people people who wouldn't likely support the conservatives and i think that's probably not a coincidence I'd also say one more thing about UBI and, you know, anybody that's familiar with my work and my views on this, I'm not a huge fan of UBI generally. I'm not opposed to it, but I just think given the money that it would cost, you know, is it the best intervention when we could socialise healthcare, transport, education uh, to a far greater extent? In a situation like this where we're about to see, according to Goldman Sachs, minus 6% um, contraction of economic activity in the US this quarter, minus 24% in the next quarter. In a situation like that, you want to boost aggregate demand. You want to get people to buy as many things as possible at the same time as disincentivizing unnecessary work. Actually, UBI would be a very effective way of doing that. You know, how could we get people to be buying, you know, the, the takeaways and the, the food delivery and the, you know, the home gyms and the books to keep, if, if, you know, to keep consumption ticking over, to keep jobs ticking over and to also access the things they need to live and, you know, not be completely depressed for the next several months. So a UBI also from the perspective of, aggregate demand is a perfectly intelligent intervention you know that's the reason why republicans in the us have been asking for it they're not they're not uh, arguing for a ubi or um, parachute money helicopter money uh, because uh, there's a social justice angle there is that as well in the in the short term they're also very very worried about just you know consumer demand collapsing which you know there's a very good chance that happening we're going to move on to our next topic in a moment, which is cops getting carried away with their new coronavirus powers. Uh, but first of all, you're watching Navarro Media, you're watching Tisky Sour. Uh, as you know, this show is only possible because of your kind support. Um, so if you are already a subscriber, thank you very much. If not, please go to support.navarromedia.com and donate the equivalent of one hour's wage a month or you know, give us whatever cash you have floating around this month that you're not spending in the pub. Um, if you are one of the people who are lucky enough that your your income is still still coming or still arriving in your bank account over this period. Um, we want more people to watch this show. So in the description on YouTube, there is a link to a tweet uh, which directs people here. So you can go down there and retweet that link. As ever, keep your comments coming on the hashtag Tisky Sour. We'll be reading out some of those through the show and going to your questions and saving some of them as questions for the end. Um, also, keep your comments coming on YouTube. We love to read it. Um, and obviously like this video that was that was a lot of requests in one hopefully mm. you, you were you were taking notes um we are going to move on now uh as i say to cops getting carried away uh with their new role uh in this coronavirus crisis of of, of policing people and shaming people when they they leave the house or, or do something that's now we collectively deem to be inappropriate um so it has only been three days since britain entered a lockdown. We talked on previous shows about how to contain the virus that might have been a little bit too late and how con the continuing of non-essential businesses might undermine the effectiveness of that lockdown. But instead of blaming the government for their tardiness or businesses for continuing to function during this time, much of Britain's establishment has been turning their attention and scorn to ordinary members of the public. Uh, perhaps predictably, it also seems the cops have now joined the public shaming campaign. Um, this was evidenced today by a mic by a tweet set out by Derbyshire Police. They had sent out a drone over the Peak District and filmed people doing things as dangerous and irresponsible as walking their dogs or watching the sunset. Um, we can now look at some of that footage there. So what you're seeing is them them zooming in on on couples walking dogs and on uh, lists a bunch of things they're doing, and they say it's not essential. Going out of your way for an Instagram snap not essential. Uh, my favorite moment is when they zoom in on people watching a sunset. They say it's not essential. Um, I mean, this seems to me a sort of funny interpretation of, of, of what it, what the government advice is in a way. I mean, the government aren't saying you can't do anything that's not essential. I'm allowed to go for a run in the morning. 
Mm. And that's not essential. I could, you know, I'm not going to die if I stay in my house, but they've decided that if the risk is fairly low, then you can go ahead um, and do it. Um, I don't know. What, what, what do you think here, Aaron? Do you think the Derbyshire police were being reasonable or unreasonable in tweeting out drone footage of people mm. going for walks on the Peak District? I think you're absolutely right. What those people are doing is in no way at odds with government advice. There were there were couples walking in twos. They weren't congregating in groups. I mean, that may be happening. I, I have no idea. We're only going on this drone footage. Uh, if you go to a, a, a local supermarket and there's uh, social distancing, the exact same measures are in place. You see people walk around in twos or once you get into the supermarket, only one of you can go in. Uh, this seems to me, basically, the police have a great piece of kit, this drone. It's been shot in 4K. They don't know what to do with it. So it's just like, OK, well, let's just use our toys. I mean, really? Uh, spying on people in, in the moors going for, you know, they are going for their state sanctioned walk. I, I, I don't see I don't see what what's driving this. So, I mean, I, I I tweeted out that video today sort of to say this seems ridiculous that the cops are doing this. Why are they, you know, flying their drone over people going for walks? The best defense I've seen of why uh, it is reasonable to discourage people from walking in the peaks was not that you're more likely to catch coronavirus by going out there, but that if you were to have an accident, it would be a greater strain on the National Health Service because they'd obviously have to, to come to that more isolated area um, to, and that to pick you up. And that legitimates a drone shooting the public in 4K. I mean, all that video, all that video, no, no, that's what, all that video tells me is that, you know, why have the police got drones? If that if that's what they're using drones for, to to, to surveil people taking walks on moors, well, it's ridiculous. I mean, this is a, I mean, for, for me, the bigger issue is, well, yes, I, 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 I completely agree with that. But also this... This urge to blame members of the public for doing, you know, fairly ordinary things, the effect of which, you know, on the coronavirus crisis is going to be incredibly, incredibly marginal. You know, the, the fact that Oxford Circus was open until Monday, mm. you know, until four days ago, that was incredibly significant to the coronavirus crisis and the number of people we're going to see entering a &E's over the next three weeks because there were thousands of people in you know, very close proximity to each other. There was, there was still you know, a very busy rush hour on Monday on the tube, as we've been talking about. Those are the kind of issues which you know, have a serious impact on an epidemic. Yeah. Uh, if we were to focus on those, that would implicate the government because the reason that Oxford Circus was super busy on Saturday, the reason that rush hour was still going on up to Monday mm. um, was because of decisions that the government made. The, the government decided we're not going to order shops to close until very, very recently. And people, you know, running past each other in Victoria Park, I say that because my local one and they closed it last night. Um, the effect that's going to have on this crisis is zero to very, very, very marginal. Mm. And the only reason I can see for this massive focus on whether or not someone spends an hour and 10 minutes outside of their house as opposed to the hour mm. um, is that it serves an ideological purpose to try yeah. and blame what we're going to see happen next in this country, which isn't going to be particularly pretty, mm. um, not on business, not on government, but on people who haven't properly to the letter followed the rules. Yeah. I mean, a big a big problem is that we've got health workers who are expected to maintain a system which is about to come under the most immense pressure. We're expecting them to go to work, be confronted with people with this illness, go back home, expose their families to this illness. I mean, them not being tested is horrendous. Now, I understand the government's taking steps to remediate that, which is fantastic. That's a bigger issue than some people going for a walk in, in the moors. And as we can see from that footage, what what they were doing and how they were walking wasn't particularly responsible. Uh, and, and like I say, it can only serve an ideological purpose. Why else would you be doing it? I want to bring up another tweet that shows it's not just, you know, the authorities doing this. And I have to admit, I've also seen this in you know the, ge the general public in WhatsApp groups and on Twitter. There are a lot of people jumping at the chance to get annoyed at, at people walking around a park, um, which to me, you know, obviously, obviously, I think that everyone watching this show and, and we all are being very responsible. Hashtag stay at home and only go out for an hour a day to do some exercise and to the shops if you 100 percent need to. Absolutely. 100 percent. That's what you should do in solidarity with with doctors and people who are you know, vulnerable from COVID-19. And actually, it's becoming increasingly apparent that more of us might be than you think. Um, but that doesn't mean 
you should focus all your ire on someone who you know went sunbathing for 10 minutes because you know the consequences of that are incredibly marginal to zero the consequences of the government keeping oxford circus open and keeping construction sites open up to now is significant focus on those things someone who is you know focusing more on the public than the government or at least more than he should be um and and is let's say is scrutinizing the government less than he should be and scrutinizing the public more than he should be is itv's political editor robert peston we're going to get up a tweet uh he sent out this morning uh he says some 2.6 million of you are not washing your hands more than usual uh 3.1 million of you are still shaking hands and hugging. 5.8 million of you are shopping for the fun of it. And 3.6 million still socializing. Those behaving anti-social, anti-socially like this are mostly young men, FFS. Um, so, you know, the argument here, this is a big, poli- a big political story is that millions and millions of young men, probably millennials, are still shaking people's <laughs> hands, not, not washing their hands enough. And this is, you know, this is one, an outrage. We all need to put moral pressure on young millennial men in this country. It's an outrage. And also, I mean, the implication is that this is going to be very significant in our collective ability to fight coronavirus. Mm. Um, I mean, the reason I think this framing is a bit daft, um, so we can look at, you know, the the poll that Robert Pesson is talking about here. It was written up in, in Politico, but it was also on his own, on his show the night previous. So we're going to go to the write up now. So the JL Partners survey, it's people whose, what Robert Robert Peston's tweet is based on, found, look away, Prime Minister, that 5% of people are still not washing their hands more than usual or for longer than usual, amounting to a mind-boggling 2.6 million people. Meanwhile, 6%, 3.1 million people, are still shaking hands and hugging, 8% are shopping when not absolutely necessary, and 7% are still seeing people outside their immediate family. Now you can look at that and see, oh, those numbers of people not washing their hands for longer than usual after we've been told by the government to do it. And actually, that's been one of the one of the only consistent messages actually from the government in terms of whether you can go out of your house or whether you can go to work or whether you can go to a football match. That's been you know, changing all the time that you should wash your hands, to be fair to the government, has been very consistent for a while. You should wash them for 20 seconds and sing happy birthday as you do it. Um, but the takeaway for me isn't really that that many people aren't washing their hands for longer than usual, but that many people are. Mm. Um, so the takeaway here for me is it, it, I don't think it seems you know shocking that 7% of people still aren't washing their hands more than usual, but the fact that 93% of people are. Mm. I mean, in terms of a percentage of the population you know, t- taking on the advice of a government to tackle uh, a disease that won't necessarily infect them. You know, people are to some degree being altruistic when they're following this, this advice because we know that you know, coronavirus disproportionately affects older people or people with underlying conditions and as will become incredibly apparent disproportionately affects medical staff and people who work in the NHS because Mm. it seems like you know what people in this country are already going through seems traumatic what people in Italy are going through seems absolutely horrific you know that could be what's coming um but to me yeah I I I just think this is completely overdone yeah like you say if it's a 93 percent um application right if we can get those numbers back up perhaps you know, for those to all be in single digits in terms of percentage points. Yeah. So look, um, 95% of the population are washing their hands more than usual. Uh, 94% uh, have stopped shaking hands and hugging. Eight, uh, 92% have, have now only shop when necessary. 93% uh, are no longer seeing people outside their immediate family. I mean, that's, that's staggering behavioral change. The idea that we should start blaming in the space of a week, I'm kind of shocked those numbers are that high. Mm. I mean, what, what, what are you expecting? You know, you were talking about 65 million people here. So I, I think it's impressive. And that is also why, you know, when the government say, we'll, we'll be able to get over this if you will follow the rules. I mean, people ask, people are following the rules and we mm. are still going to see a big pile up of people in the NHS over the next couple of weeks. Um, you know, hopefully that will, you know, hopefully that, that that crush on NHS capacity will be as small as possible. But when it does happen, let's remember that it's not the fault of someone who went sunbathing. We're going to move on to our next topic and our next guest. We're going to bring in David Adler live from Rome. Uh, so one advantage of doing these shows, you know, from our from our living rooms is whilst we're further away from our usual Navara contributors, it's actually easier to get people in from abroad. Um, have we got David there? Can we get him in? Perfect. Hey, hey how's it going? 
lovely to see you. The first human contact I've had all day. So <laughs> it's a real pleasure. Uh, you, you, you were telling me earlier that, you know, I, I introduced this show, started this show by saying that I was, you know, pleasantly surprised that everyone in Hackney and from what I've seen on Twitter across the UK uh, is not too shy to clap for the NHS. Obviously, the first time we saw this phenomenon was, you know, in Italy. Um, people singing from their balconies as well. But you, you said to me earlier that that phase is over, right? Yeah, it's it strikes me that you guys are really you're still in phase two, which is the honeymoon phase. You know, mm. oh, so much time to read, so much time to sit back to celebrate the glories of the NA, of, of the NHS. And you know, we we passed through that as well, and in fact had a lot of viral content for these great moments of bella ciao from the balconies. Uh, we've moved now through, I think, two two more phases. One was a kind of boredom and restlessness phase, which really got got to me on a deep spiritual level. And now we've moved into a more depressed kind of this is the new normal. There is no there is no way out. Um, and I think you know it just understanding that this thing is going to move in phases, even from that, I'm sure the political dynamics we'll, we'll get to. Uh, is I think difficult to accept because it feels like, okay, I can just stay inside. Come on, this is one thing. Simple orders, wash my hands, you know, go for a run maybe. Uh, but actually it's been evolving. And the Italian response has been evolving uh, as well from the, from the government side. So, you, you know, it's not just lockdown, stay inside. Every day, new restrictions, kind of the noose gets tighter around, around the neck. It started where, you know, you could, some, some shops were closing down and stuff like that. Um, and then, and then it was soon, okay, 6 p.m., everything shut. And then it was everyone inside. There was more and more police on the street. Uh, you know, this is a country that doesn't, it's not famous for having a vast police presence on the streets, hassling you on the street corners, stopping and frisking. Uh, but in, over time, now we're seeing more and more police. The army's back on the streets. Uh, and, you know, in the current phase that we're in now, people are, you know, really, really, because of their own fears about the virus, as well as because of their anxieties about seeing the police in the street or are, are, are staying inside uh, for now 18, 18 straight days. Wow. I mean, that's interesting. You talk about anxieties about seeing the police in the streets because your your article that was published in the New Statesman um, this morning um, was about how people are becoming more comfortable with authority in, in Italy. So I'll, I'll read out the subheading now, which said, virtually overnight, Italians have shifted from dismissive cynicism of their national government to a blind and trusting devotion, even as the nation shut down and residents were shut in. I suppose, you, can, you, can you talk me through, you know, part of that argument you were making and this idea that one of the political outcomes of, of COVID-19 and the coronavirus crisis has been people falling back in love with the state, as it were. The Italian state is famous domestically, I think internationally, for its dysfunction. I mean, this is a, a state that's very leaky, lots of corruption. You know, there's a, there's a great phrase that was coined by the, the Northern League, that far-right party now run by Matteo Salvini, which was Roma ladrona, Rome, Rome thieves from the nation. And even though it, you know, it came out of the far right, it's really a sentiment that, that is really widely shared, that um, the Italian state is just incapable of delivering on basic services and is quite incompetent. And there's a deep distrust of the state for that reason, a, a distrust that both leaves lots of room for dangerous strains of rightist anti-system politics, as well as room for more exciting, liberatory anarchist types of politics as well. What's happened virtually overnight, as I, as I set out in that, in that piece, is that people are kind of begging for clear instructions, right? The old theatrics of Italian populism, both in the kind of Sardine side, packing into town squares, as well as the kind of theatrics of the great men, rightist populism, have been replaced by a, a desperate desire for a more technocratic form of, of politics. Um, and it's been fascinating to watch that distrust completely give way to total devotion, I mean, people sticking to their screens, watching these wartime speeches. You guys had one from Boris Johnson. We've had a series of them from Giuseppe Conte, whose approval rating has gone from, you know, a, 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 south of 50%, 44% roughly, to over 70%, the highest approval rating of any prime minister in the history of post-war Italy. Um, you know, and in that, in that process, people are coming to love the state again and coming to respect these, these rules um, without ever asking, did parliament approve these rules? Uh, what happened to my civil liberties 
And how long exactly am I going to be expected to stay inside and respect these rather draconian, uh, and as I mentioned before, increasingly draconian measures? I want to get up a, a video that we've, we've actually shown similar videos on, on the show before, and they've been going viral on social media, um, which is Italian mayors in, you know, being very charismatically telling people to stay inside they've been shared because you know both they're funny and also they've been contrasted with the the kind of shonky and, and confusing messaging that's come from british leaders let's show that now mi arrivano notizie che qualcuno vorrebbe preparare la festa di laurea mandiamo i carabinieri ma li mandiamo con i lanciafiamme che domani ti becco domani non pensiate tra anni domani sono il sindaco sul mio territorio non si passeggia non vi posso impedire formalmente di uscire da casa? Bene, vi impedisco di passare sul suolo pubblico. <laughs> so, I, mean, my, I think most people's initial reaction to seeing those was that they were, they were very entertaining, the idea that if people go out of their houses, out of their houses, um, you know, the mayor will come around with a flamethrower, um, you know, very performative. And when we still had Boris Johnson, you know, talking about how uh, we need to wait for enough people to get coronavirus before we close down Primark in Oxford Street, you know, we were like, we, we'd, we'd actually prefer a bit of that clarity of message. But, you know, now that I've seen the Derbyshire police, you know, follow people with drones across the Peak District, um, I'm starting to worry that actually potentially these performative, you know, outbursts against members of the public who are potentially flouting uh, self-isolation norms could be, you know, the sign of a, a not particularly healthy authoritarianism that could emerge from this particular <laughs> crisis. I don't know. Am I taking this too seriously? No, I mean, everything, everything hinges on how long this thing lasts. Everything. Because there are multiple breaking points. Let's take two very different breaking points. Let's say Italy succeeds to flatten its curve, okay? Then you end up with a breaking point of people being like, hold on, I've been inside for, let me check my watch, 45 days straight, which is what most of us expect to be inside for. We flatten the curve, let me out, okay? Let me finally go be with my friends, go enjoy the summer. The mosquitoes are coming into Rome at the moment. You know, let me at least enjoy the positive aspects of summer without suffering indoors in the unbearable heat, right? So that's one breaking point. And that's if Italy succeeds in its medical response. The emergency measures become a question of social and political negotiation. The other breaking point is equally dangerous. Let's say Italy doesn't succeed to flatten its curve. And the numbers just, just keep rising. I mean, it's a horrible possibility and we hope it doesn't happen. But remember that the virus is by and large a Northern phenomenon. It has not come down South, come down South, uh, you know, um, to, cent to the central, to central to Lazio where I am now, or to the South, which has much worse health provision. You know, people give these horrible images of Lombardia as if it's a poor region of Europe. It's one of the richest regions of Europe. That health system is one of the best in the world. And it's being stress tested this way to horrible, to a horrible outcome. My point is to say, if, if they don't flatten that curve and the infections keep ripping through the country, there's also a breaking point there where people are being like, I'm staying in my house for what? What is the point of me respecting these rules if we're all going to get this thing anyway? So everyone's kind of, I mean, behind the scenes here in Rome, you know, people are really crossing their fingers. Like, let's get a lid on this thing because it's just not clear how long the, the, the legitimacy boost that's been given to incumbents, of course, here, as well as uh, in, in the UK and even in the United States, where Trump has a 60% approval rating for his handling of the corona crisis. You know, it's not clear how long that can last for. And again, we go back to this question of phases uh, and when, when, you know, when we enter a new phase where social unrest, which has not been a feature of the coronavirus crisis anywhere in the world, where the social reaction becomes uh, a, a dimension of the crisis itself. Yeah, I mean, it's a really good point. And I think it's particularly pertinent today when you've seen US unemployment statistics, 3.3 million people this week uh, are uh, basically going on, we call in Britain on the dole, they're you know, applying for job seekers allowance. It was the biggest weekly uh, increase ever. Uh, and there, I tweeted a picture about this. You can look at the 1987 recession. You can look at the global financial crisis. You can look at the 1970s oil crisis. They're kind of like little bumps. This is like an L, 3.3 million in one week. If that happens for two weeks in a row, I think David's absolutely right. People say, look, we're looking at minus 10% economic contraction here, mass unemployment, 
let's just take it on the chin. Now, I obviously think that's a ridiculous approach, but you can see Trump already trying to pivot towards that in the last couple of days. They're seeing the scale of the economic calamity that's going to come about with this. They probably recognize they haven't got a sufficiently robust healthcare system to deal with anyway in America. And so, like you said, a bit like the problem you get in, in the Italian South. So they think, I mean, you know, why not? We'll, we'll, we'll take the we'll take the political sort of. We'd rather take the political overhead of a hundred thousand people dying than the political overhead of uh, of an economic downturn bigger than the uh, the Great Depression. I mean, that's a calculation that politicians have to make because they have to be reelected. But it's, that's, I mean, it has to be taken seriously. And that's the top down version of this. I mean, I think that from the supply side of the politics, from the from the government perspective, there is that question of when do how, for how long do we choose to suppress infections at the cost of our economy? How long can that go on for? It's a horrible question. No one wants to answer it. I won't even attempt to answer it. But there's an equally important question of how it bubbles up from the demand side. You know, let's take the U.S. case. Let's take New York City because I think it is the clearest illustration of this, right? New York City is full of horrendous, leaky, shitty housing, right? And we know for a fact that the response from Congress to the massive spike in unemployment is going to be at best slow, at worst, completely dysfunctional. That money will never arrive to the people who need it most. Okay, you're uh, a lower income family, you know, you're six people in a two bedroom apartment. Um, you've been cooped up in one of those tiny windowless, lightless apartments in New York City. And you're like, oh my God, I can't do this for 20 days. I'm gonna go hang out in the park with my friends. You go and hang out in the park with your friends. The, the NYPD shows up, the famously patient, non-aggressive, you know, no police brutality, police force of New York City shows up. Something as always goes wrong. Two people get killed. No one has money. And then you're thinking, why, why am I staying inside for this? Why am I not out on the streets? And so when I talk about the phases of this, I mean to say that this thing is going to have different dimensions of this. You know, it's a compounding crisis. The health crisis has given rise because it's mandated this vast lockdown to an economic crisis. But that economic crisis will soon, in my opinion, very, very soon reap a social crisis which has not been a feature of, the, of this so far. And then I think in the Italian case, in the best case scenario, what will happen is that economic crisis, which is you know the, what I think I, I say in this New Statesman piece is that a, a medical crisis uh, can instantiate legitimacy for a state because we're all equal. It's good for democracy, right? We all recognize that we're equally vulnerable, equally mortal in the face of this invisible virus that we can all get infected by. But an economic crisis has a clear distributional impact, right? And in the case of Italy, most fascinating, uh, that impact is going to play along the exact same cleavage by which we saw the original strain of rightist Italian populism emerge. Namely, it's quite clear that once the Italian economy begins to get its wheels moving again, the North, which is the more prosperous part of Italy, will get its supply chains running, become much more prosperous. And the South, who's heavily dependent on tourism, who will have lost an entire year, if not more, of tourism as we enter mm. this depressive mode, that those wounds will get ripped open again. And this brief period of like national applauding our national health service, this brief period of singing to each other and kind of viral sensational national cohesion will very quickly give way to familiar distributional conflicts. Uh, and I don't think that that's going to take us very long to arrive at that ugly place. I want to cover two things. One, which we'll go to in a moment, is is the sort of European dimension. I know you work for work a lot with Europe, the, the democracy in in Europe movement, DM twenty five, with people like Yanis Varoufakis. This is something you you follow closely. Um, before that, though, I, I just quickly want to, you know, people often talk about Italy as in that's that's the UK in three weeks. So that that, that often has a medical dimension. So the idea that you know the, Italy's uh, health service has has you know, begun to collapse under the strain of, of the number of people that need to go into the ICU. But there's also a political dimension of that and a sort of sociological dimension. Um, and so, yeah, I feel like we're, we're all very aware in this phase that you called it the honeymoon period, but it's also the period whereby, uh, you know, political journalists and members of the public and politicians are all sort of blaming fairly blameless people, people going for a run, people sunbathing, you know, maybe maybe they shouldn't be doing it in the place they're doing it, but it's not the end of the world. I feel like, did you, you had that phase in Italy, right? Where, you know, all the, all the anger and all the wrath was directed at joggers, for example. Did <laughs> yeah, that happen? Definitely, definitely. I mean, Italy went through a, because it was ground zero of sorts for 
the virus in the West, it went through a very particular evolution of the policy response. Namely, it got to, got to Milan, it got to Lombardia, and it was a problem, but it was not taken very seriously. And then you had the reaction, a very Trumpian reaction from uh, Salvini and his ilk, who were basically like, nope, actually Milan is open for business. We're not going to be, you know, and it was sort of like a Milan strong kind of campaign to say, we are not going to let the productive part of this country go offline because of a silly virus, right? Um, and what, because it began that way, uh, then when these measures were introduced and the severity of the crisis became clear, I think we kind of skipped ahead a bit. There wasn't that period of uh, dallying around with pointing fingers and such, and, uh, but we moved very quickly into a lockdown period. Now, I do think you're right to point out the fascinating differences uh, in the way that re this response is, is also a product or a function of actually existing social norms and the way those interact with the medical crisis. So one of the main reasons Italy has been very bad is one of the ongoing theories that I find most compelling is because the depth of the economic crisis here between 2010 and 2021, well, and the present, means that so many young people live with their families because they can't afford anything else, right? Um, so that's one way in which the sociological dimension or the socioeconomic kind of, you know, shape of Italy interacts with the medical crisis in a way that in, in the British case is going to be different. But in the British case, or I should say in the Anglo cases, you're talking about a social fabric, like a Swiss cheese social fabric with huge holes in it, right? At least in the Italian case where the people are living with their families, there's a lot of solidarity. There's, a, the, the, you know, Familism has many problems and is, has many ties to reactionary politics, but at least it kind of has bound the Italians uh, closer together. Whereas in the sort of British and American cases, it's so atomized already that I think it's much more prone to the kind of finger pointing you were describing because people are looking for that kind of, you know, pointing to their neighbor or pointing to someone on the street and looking for a way to kind of protect themselves as opposed to making a more communal response. We're going to talk about the geopolitics and the European Union in a moment. First of all, there's 1,500 of you watching it. There's 500 of you who have, have given it a like. Uh, so two-thirds of you haven't. Go on. It doesn't cost you a thing. It helps us with the algorithm. And it gets us up in those YouTube charts, which mean that more people will watch critical journalism in a time you know, uh, which I think we all think, we all like to think that critical journalism is is more important than ever. The decisions that the government will be making, you know, over the coming days, you know, will one will be incredibly impactful in terms of the lives that are lost over the next few months and also in terms of how they structure society in decades to come. So um, I think it's it's important that that left-wing independent media has, has a loud voice in this period of time. I'm going to go back to you, David, because I want to know... Yeah, the, the geopolitical dimension to this. And I've been seeing sort of mixed messages from what I've been reading about um, the Italian situation. On the one hand, you see, especially on social media, sort of a lot of talk about how China have shown more solidarity to, to countries like Italy than their European neighbors, um, you know, to, to quite a lot of fanfare. Um, there have been, you know, large exports of, of PPE, so personal protective equipment to Italy from China and some complaints that, you know, Germany hasn't been quite so forthcoming. I've seen some pushback against that recently as well to say that actually Germany was being more, more generous than people thought. They just weren't, you know, shouting about it. They didn't, they weren't so good at strategic comms. I, I wonder if you could comment on the, the dimension of the coronavirus crisis in Italy and how it relates to, you know, so-called European solidarity? Well, you know, it's it's interesting you say the Germans aren't good. It, you're, you're right, the Germans aren't good at strategic comms. Unfortunately for them, in a crisis, strategic communications are everything. I mean, I think that, you know, we see these viral images of solidarity. Okay, the Cuban case was one, tons of stuff from China. I mean, these images are durable. They last. When it comes to geopolitics and earning soft power, that is, that's serious. I mean, uh, and especially when it comes to uh, a European situation that has been dominated for over a decade by these beggar thy neighbor policies where the North is pitted against the South, Germans against the Greeks, and, and, and the, or the pigs, I should say, creditor against debtor, you know, this is poked right at an open wound there, you know, and now we have what, what we're calling sicken thy neighbor policies, where Germany is refusing to export medical supplies, 
uh, south to Italy where it's most needed. Now, you're right to say that in many of these cases, it's overblown. And there are increasing efforts to coordinate the response, uh, you know, have more solidarity when it comes to making sure that medical supplies are moving across borders and that's the relevant uh, amount of support. But there's, uh, at risk of getting a bit too technical, I want to go to the question of the euro bond. Do I have your permission to try to explain? <laughs> you you have the permission, but talk, you, you've got to, you're going to have to start by explaining the euro bond, but I know oh, you're good at explaining okay. things. So that's going to happen. Okay. You have my blessing. Thank you. Okay. Italy, like m many member states, needs money desperately to invest in health services, to invest in communities devastated by this crisis. They need money. Now, because of the complicated architecture of the Eurozone, European Union more broadly, there are strict constraints on the money that's available to them, the fiscal resources that are available to them to give, to, to pay out money. Now, the big debate that's happening in Europe right now is whether or not Europe should create a mutualized debt instrument, a bond across the whole Eurozone, where it would be like, okay, all of us are in the Eurozone. This is an exogenous shock. We're all being affected by this thing. We have to issue these bonds together. Now, the major, and so I, I say this because the European Council is meeting tonight. So all the you know prime ministers are, uh, and presidents are, are on meeting tonight, and to discuss or maybe not discuss whether they will have create this mutualized debt instrument. Right. This is this is the this is the peak of the question of whether or not Europe has solidarity, whether or not there's going to be a solidaristic response to the coronavirus in Europe. Will there be meaningful fiscal resources generated across the eurozone? Now, there are two primary proposals that we need to discuss to understand how the question of solidarity is filtering into this debate about the Eurobond. One camp suggests that the Eurobond is made through the European Stability Mechanism, the so-called ESM. ESM is a bailout facility that was invented in 2012 as a way of bailing out these bankrupt countries, the pigs, in, uh, in the course of the sovereign debt crisis. So one proposal is to use the ESM to create those mutualized debt instruments. Now, the problem with that is that the ESM is a synthetic bond, which means that every bond that's made is a little bit German, a little bit Italian, a little bit Spanish. And if any one of those countries goes belly up, all the rest of the people who are, are on the hook in that synthetic bond for the debt that they can't pay. Now, the reason why this is a problem, as the Dutch and the Germans will tell you, is that it has horrible moral hazard, right? We all create the bond together, and then you can basically fuck off, and the rest of us have to pay. And so that's that. So there's one proposal to do it through the ESM, which which is getting a lot of pushback because of this question of moral hazard. And there's another proposal to do it strictly through the European Central Bank, which would be a genuine, genuinely unified response that would allow the ECB, the European Central Bank to deliver those necessary fiscal resources to the countries that need them most. Now, what do we think is going to happen <laughs> at the European Council meeting tonight? What we think is going to happen at the European Council meeting tonight is the Germans, as they always do, will trot out the Dutch to do their dirty work, and the Dutch will kill any mention of Eurobonds. Now, I hope I'm wrong, but I'm almost 100% sure that this is what's going to happen. Uh, because at the end of the day, these questions of solidarity are filtered through this architecture of the European Union that is kind of geared toward fragmentation. So that's what's on, on the table tonight for the European Union is disintegration or finally unification that it so desperately needs. And how does that play out in terms of, I suppose, on the ground Italian politics and people's attitudes towards the EU? Because I suppose, you know, I was initially asking you about things like ventilators and, and, and PPE face masks. That's that's that what that's what seems most tangible in, in this in this period. Who's who's sending ventilators and how many? But I suppose what you've described is that actually just as important as that, potentially more important than that, is you know, the question of fiscal firepower and how easy is it to borrow as a state. So one advantage that, you know, the United States and Britain have had in tackling coronavirus, even though obviously the United States are kind of fucking it up at this point in time, is that they can basically borrow as much money as they want at incredibly low interest rates and just, you know, spend like they've never spent before. And presumably the Italians are much more constrained than that because than, than, than we are because they can't print money in that same way. 
is it is it is it harder for them to get cash to deal with this crisis than it is for for someone like well for someone like Britain? Yes, such as the nature of of a currency union, uh, and there was this famous a famous tweet, truly Hall of Fame gaff tweet from the European Central Bank. I guess it was two weeks ago. It feels like it was ten years ago, where Christine Lagarde, formerly head of the IMF and member of the Troika, now president of the ECB, said, "It is not our job." as the ECB, to narrow spreads. It is not our job to make sure that the cost of Italian debt is similar to the cost of German debt. Basically just ripping open those wounds that were barely, barely sewn shut in the years since the sovereign debt crisis. Now, I know I'm speaking in a kind of boring and inaccessible and maybe even confusing way about the issue of the euro bonds, but you would be surprised at how thoroughly politicized this question is in Italy. I mean, people are really paying attention. Mm. That Lagarde tweet, as garbled and technocratic as its language was, was incendiary in the Italian case. Massive spike in a Eurosceptic position that had basically been taken off the table. You'll remember that just two years ago, we had a general election in Italy by which, during which both Salvini, the League, and Cinque Stelle, the Five Star Movement, ran on a platform of a referendum on Eurozone membership. Now, within a year after that, what happened? Brexit happened, and the Italians basically were like, whoops, sorry about that, forget it. Too complicated, too costly. What's happening now, and the stakes of the present reaction of the council meeting tonight, and the general reaction of the European institutions will be, do we, are we again tabling Euroscepticism? Is the, is the survival of the European Union, which we just, we just decided was no longer a question when we booted Britain, <laughs> will that again be the topic of debate for the next five years, the next, you know, the next mandate of the commission that just came into power uh, after the European elections in May 2019? I'm going to go to you, Aaron, and then we're going to go to comments and questions. So get your get your questions in either on the hashtag Tisky Sour on Twitter or in the comments under the YouTube video. Aaron, yeah, I think I think it's going to bring back that question of uh, debt crises, sovereign debt, in a massive way. Um, we mentioned it yesterday on the show. This article by Noriel Rabini in the Guardian. Uh, about how a crisis which took three years in 2007, 8, 9, or with the Great Depression from 29 to 32, we're seeing something basically happen, which is just as big, if not bigger, in three weeks. Uh, we're seeing a public health crisis become a, very quickly, which will become a fiscal crisis, which will become a sovereign debt crisis, um, because Italy can't run deficits of 8 9%. Uh, and like I say, in the Financial Times today, there's talk of Britain, if we have a, a significant recession, if government intervention is on the scale of what we're seeing for a prolonged period of time, just several months, not years, Britain would be running a deficit of around 9% uh, going into next year. Uh, Italy can't do that. Spain can't do that. Greece can't do that. France can't do that. Uh, and so I, Dev is absolutely right. This is going to bring back the question of... Um, uh, the need for uh, economic and fiscal integration within the Eurozone members, within the core members, just when we thought it had gone away. Uh, and it's not just an issue for the global north, for the Eurozone, which is, it's huge for the Eurozone, by the way. It's another existential question for the Eurozone, this, just as um, we got a sovereign debt crisis after the global financial crisis 2009 that asked existential questions for the Eurozone, particularly with regards to Greece. This time it might be another state, it might be France, it might be Italy, it's looking like Italy. Uh, there's also the issue of, of the global south. You know, we, we could see dozens of countries having domestic debt crises after this. We're so, already, yeah. we're already there. You know, so, you know, in just the last two months, we have seen the single largest evacuation of capital from the global mm. south. $85 billion um, uh, dollars have flowed out of emerging markets in the last two months alone, which is the largest capital outflow on record over three times the amount that happened in the 2008 crisis, right? They do not have resources. And it's a perfect storm that's brewing, right? So you have the stripping away of access to dollars. Uh, and in the Italian case, whatever, you have, you have these massive needs for fiscal resources, right? So you have a monetary crisis, just as a medical crisis requires the greatest fiscal response. Now, 
you know, in both in Britain and the United States, the, the exorbitant privilege of being able to have this very powerful currency that you can mint and you can deploy makes the politics so much smoother. I mean, really can reduce the tension that's going to emerge in the case of the Eurozone. But, you know, you better believe that we're days away from, uh, God, I hope, a kind of battle for Seattle situation where the IMF is once again under the microscope saying, how are we going to handle uh, an economic crisis that is ricocheting all around the world, forcing these countries into deep positions of debt, they're begging for bailouts, and then the fight is going to be in Europe as around the world. Do we have conditionality attached to that? Do we do austerity redux and learn nothing from our experience of the past 10 years, and in the case of the IMF and the World Bank, the past 40 years? Do we learn nothing and repeat those same mistakes? There was a recent statement by David Malpass, who's the president of the World Bank, saying, uh, yeah, you can have money from the World Bank, but you have to undergo serious structural adjustment to make sure you can pay us back. Are we going to go down that route? Or are we going to go down the route of mutualized debt instruments, to be kind of annoying about it in, in the European case, as a sincere, genuine euro bond that unifies Europe and it delivers those fiscal resources without sowing the seeds of fragmentation along the way? And are we going to generate, as I would think, you know, you, we can get to that in a different discussion, a different day. Are we going to use the IMF uh, and similar institutions for good, delivering those resources where they're needed most and not expecting that they punish their citizens to pay them back, uh, you know, in its aftermath? That really is the situation that we're finding ourselves in. And it's interesting that Europe, once again, is the microcosmic expression of a broader, more global, you know, medical, monetary, economic overlapping crisis. Uh, this is also all overlapping with the collapse in the price of oil. And so for many countries, particularly in West Asia, you've got outflows of foreign capital, you've got collapse in the price of oil, you've got a public health crisis. Important to add to that, it's often not talked about in this kind of panoply of crises that determine the 21st century, the end of US hegemony. You have America withdrawing from Afghanistan, hopefully soon Iraq. Uh, and I suppose one alternative is the IMF steps up or it doesn't, or China steps up. You know, China becomes the global hegemon perhaps 20 years sooner than we thought it might. Uh, if America handles this poorly, if China handles it, you know, better, uh, it could become the world's largest economy, you know, in five to 10 years rather than 10 to 20 years. Uh, and the debtor countries right now of the global south will be looking to, to Beijing, to Shanghai for political leadership rather than uh, Washington and Brussels to a lesser extent. On the hashtag Tisky Sour, Mike McCarthy tweets, we need to defend our rights to go for a walk, police state. I agree, we do need to defend our rights to go for a walk. Um, Oliver says, we need YouTube to add a multiple likes function, valuing Navarra more than ever right now. So much gratitude to all of you lot who are making this happen. Kiss, kiss. Uh, thank you very much, it's very kind. Uh, Stephanie Purcell asks, how will this pan out when there are people with mental health who are suicidal at the thought of being trapped indoors for months and are terrified of police on the streets with no mental health support? I personally think that's an incredibly um, important point, especially, and I, and I do think there's, you know, a, a, a certain, what well, many people actually who aren't really being talked enough about in this, uh, in the current advice we're receiving, which is people who live on their own. So what the current government advice is, is that you can go outside, you can go for a walk, but you can only be in close proximity with people within your household. Now that's, you know, it's, you know, it might be inconvenient, but it's ultimately fine if you live with your partner or your family. I mean, it depends how close you are or how, how healthy your relationship is. But in any case, you're not going to get incredibly lonely. People who live on their own and they're told you can only go for a walk with people from within your own household, what's their way out? Um, and there is also, to my mind, a, a bit of a worrying disconnect between the way that you hear doctors and even politicians talk about this and then how it's written down in law and how it may or may not be interpreted by the police, right? So when I've heard you know, on, on BBC Radio 5 or sometimes in those 5 p.m. press conferences, uh, one of the one of the medical officers or a, you know, a, a GP is asked, what should I do in this situation if I live on my own, my friend lives on our own, you know, we're both lonely, we want to go for a walk together. And they're like, oh, well, just use your common sense. But then at the same time, you've got, you know, police who are saying, are you in the same household? Then you shouldn't be sitting on that bench. Um, which I think is happening actually at the moment. That's one of the reasons that Victoria Park, my local park, got closed because they thought that too many people were sitting close to each other. And I think loneliness 
Um, and you know, an unnecessary an unnecessary degree of loneliness could be a real worrying outgrowth of this particular crisis. I don't know what either of you think about that particular question. Aaron, do you want to come in? About the loneliness, I mean, it's. I, mean, yeah. I was talking about this earlier to my partner. I just can't. I can't imagine what it's like. You know, it will put significant strain on somebody. Are, are you asking me? I'm happy to explain what it's like. Uh, 18 days into complete and total. Hey, do you live on your own? I There's a question. Yeah. Somebody okay. asked in the, in the questions. Actually, if you're single, David, you can actually answer two questions <laughs> in one. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I've been living alone, and I, 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 you know, I've been watching. I can see right now through my balcony. Uh, there is this two 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 very handsome couples with a very nice apartment. They hang out, they sunbathe all day, and I'm I sometimes I go up to my balcony and eat lunch and hope to get their eye. You know, like, hey, like maybe invite me over for an aperitivo. I think that they know that I'm doing that, and I've been very very clever at not inviting me over. I'm telling myself it's for medical reasons and not because I think I'm the creep who lives across the street. But uh, yeah, I think they're playing a board game. So you know. It does get lonely. It's not not great, but um, you know I have this huge tome, and I don't speak Italian very well. So my hope is that by the end of it, uh, I can <laughs> I can make my way through it. So if you you haven't been in close human proximity with another person for eighteen days now, if I told you the truth, then I would be admitting to a violation of Italian law. Okay, yeah, and, and then you'd become a social pariah. Terrorist. Exactly. So for all legal purposes, if you're listening. Conte, yes, I've been completely alone for 18 days. Some some mayor is going to come around with a flame <laughs> yeah, exactly. right now because of um, the suspicions raised in that answer. Uh, the Lesser Feet asks, will we see mass protests, riots in a time of social distancing? Um, I mean, that would presumably be against all advice uh, from the government and from the chief medical officers. But uh, you, you kind of mentioned this earlier, David. What do you think? I just think this is this gets at the truly unprecedented nature of the present crisis, which is that all the same dynamics that we would associate with social unrest, mass unemployment, um, you know, political sort of incompetence, all this stuff that gets people on the street. We know I've been on the street with with both of you uh, protesting these same things. All this stuff is happening and it's being supercharged by this completely shock, this shock depression that we're entering. At the same time as we're being told to isolate in our houses. And I think that that settlement looks stable for a little while. Like, okay, everyone stay inside while we figure this thing out. And then very quickly, I don't, I think we'll unravel very quickly and become very, very unstable because you're toggling the, you, you know, there's no middle ground of mediating a kind of peaceful protest. You're toggling between the, in, the, the feeling of being cooped up in your house and the kind of exuberance of, be violating the law the second you step outside of it. So that's why I feel the situation is so flammable because, you know, it's so extreme and actually the social contract that we've written very hastily it can just be ripped up in a heartbeat. Yeah, that, that's super interesting. I suppose, yeah, what, like one theory about like crime and, and law breaking is that if you break a little law, that's kind of a gateway drug to breaking more laws because a barrier has been breached. It's like the broken window theory in, in, in New York, where they, they came down really hard on people who broke windows because they thought that, well, or they thought that the image of broken windows was one reason people thought crime was acceptable. If we're in a situation where to leave your house with more than just the people in your household is itself uh, criminal, or in this country it has been made, you know, the police can give you on the spot fines, then there could be, you know, a moment whereby hundreds of thousands of people in in a in a city or borough have have broken the law just by the act of leaving the house, and then we'll, it'll be interesting where that gateway drug takes them. Uh, we'll go to you, Aaron, and then some final thoughts from David, and then we'll we'll close the show, Aaron. Yeah, I agree with I agree with what David said. Um, I think it's going to be a a real challenge to maintain public order. I mean, I said that a few weeks back. Uh, and Britain, the United States, has the advantage of, uh, you know, it's not, it, the Tories don't like running a 9% deficit. A Tory chancellor does not like saying, okay, look, we're going to spend here £100 billion. They have to do it to main, maintain public order, to maintain, uh, like you say, this the social contract track, which has been arbitrarily drawn up all of a sudden in one week, you can't leave your house. There is a real, uh, there is a real elasticity that's gone once you start making people do that. Uh, once you start saying you can't go to work, you can't earn a wage. Uh, and people who give a lot of give and take often with the state, I, I can't remember, maybe David knows this better than I do. You know, Britain was always four meals away from uh, civil disorder. 
Uh, and there's a reason there's there's a reason why, you know, there's been a, a you know, real sustained effort to ensure that people aren't going without food and, and bare essentials and so on. It's not out of the goodness of their hearts. I'm, sure, I'm not saying Tories are all, oh, all evil. Yeah. Uh, no, exactly. I'm, I'm not saying that entirely, but there, there is a their electoral base as well. I mean, of the course. old generation, at least. No, no, of course. But you and I have both said we're surprised at the extent to which the Tories have stepped in economically. You know, it, yeah. it completely yeah. is at odds with any economic principles they more generally hold. The reason being, if they don't do that, I'm not. It's not a question of morality. It's a. It's a question of political expediency. They have to do it, uh, and so I think David's absolutely right. It's something to keep an eye out for. But I think maybe he can talk about this when he sums up. It's something. Uh, it seems to me it's almost inevitable. It's going to happen in some parts of Southern Europe. Yeah, I, I just feel like you know there's been a sense in which the the, the increase in support for these governments has been taken as like. Uh, a positive approval rating when it's not. In fact, what it is is an investment of a tremendous amount of goodwill by the public to say, you know what? You could be doing a shitty job. I don't know, but I'm participating in a national response mm -hmm. and I'm going to go along with this. To go back to my earlier theme about there being phases of this, you know, competence is a, is a, is a, is a flow, not a stock. People are constantly updating their evaluation of how our government's doing, what a, what a policy response is, good or bad. That goodwill can be revoked just as quickly as it was doled out. I mean, think about, especially in the British case, just how little police force was used. I know we talked about it's ramping up, but just how little police force was actually used to get you guys and your viewers inside your homes, right, to, to, to participate in this amazing demobilization of the labor force and social isolation exercise. You know, that, that's, I, I agree with you, Aaron, that's a, this is a febrile situation. And I think, I think that our leaders know it. Um, and I think that that is, uh, I think that they're very scared about this. And I think that, that the, you know, we're going to, the politics are going to ram back into this very quickly. I don't, I, I think you're, in the, within the next two weeks, we're going to see a, a Corona politics in a way that it has been demobilized by this experience thus far. I suppose um, we should we should close by saying, whilst we think it's a very interesting question how these protests are going to develop, we don't advocate anyone leaving their house at this point in time and, and starting a big street protest because we are all in favour of this this current phase of social distancing, even if the police are going a bit gung ho by you know following people with drones who are walking their dogs. Um, so yeah, I don't think any of us will be will be out on the streets rioting or smashing windows. Well, we've, I'd never do that anyway. I hadn't but, even yeah. entered my mind, Michael. <laughs> yeah. I suppose what I'm saying is, yeah. I don't know why you're, you're implicating yourself when nobody had actually thought that. I, don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I doff protest too much. Um, in any case, uh, thank you so much for joining us this evening, David. You've been a pleasure. Thank you guys for having me, really. It's um, the best part of my day. <laughs> I suppose there's not much competition <laughs> right? stuck with that big, big book in Italian. Uh, Aaron, thank you again for joining me this evening. My pleasure. I thought that was fantastic getting back on and definitely and thank you for watching tisky sour thank you for watching novara media we'll be back tomorrow night and we will be talking about the situation in america uh donald trump's response to coronavirus which has been all over the place um from sort of taking it seriously to now saying that we should just you know let the economy move and if old people die they die a bit like britain 12 12 12 days ago in fact but in any case we'll have michael brooks on that show who himself hosts a brilliant youtube podcast the michael brooks show so tune in tomorrow night at 8 p.m good night